they'll tell us where you are in the world. Are you a social worker? Are you a student? What area are you in? Um, and we will get going with webinar number 58. Um, so look in the chat and let's have a look. If you want to tell us um, how confident maybe you feel with this subject. So tonight we're looking at diversity and culturally competent practice. So be brave. Tell us in the chat how confident do you feel with this subject? I'll be honest with you now, I feel like I could know a little bit more about this, a lot more about this. So I'm really looking forward to tonight. So um, I'm just going to hand over tonight. If you've been to our webinars before, you'll know that we have loads of different styles. So some of our webinars are led by the team. Next week, the team will be leading the webinar and we're going to be looking at does love have a role in social work? And we'll be talking about professional love. Um, but some weeks we have panel sessions. So in a couple of weeks time, we've got a hospital social work session full of a panel of hospital based social workers. And sometimes the sessions are handed over and we provide our platform to someone who's going to be a guest who's going to lead us through the whole session. And so tonight our session is led by our special guest, Vivian, who is going to introduce herself to you in a moment when we hand over and just to say that um see i've got vivian's book here look i have actually got a signed copy of the book and so we thought um this would be a really good topic for us to be talking about this um this week um but as you know if you've been to our sessions before every season we like to do some sessions around anti-racism um equality and diversity so i think in a couple of weeks time we've got an anti-racism um extend extending the debate session and tonight looking all about looking at diversity with vivian so vivian i'm going to hand over to you and leave it entirely up to you for the night you've got the screen sharing and everything i don't have to do anything but i can just <laughs> sit in the chat and learn i've got my notepad and pen and i'm ready to learn so i'll hand over to you thank you very much fantastic thank you so much siobhan and crew and everyone for inviting me to your sub webinar today it's an absolute pleasure to be here so my name is vivian okese tirado i'm an advanced social worker and a practice educator in West Sussex County Council. I'm also the author of Diversity Acrostic Poem and the, and the book itself, Diversity Acrostic Poem, working with diversity and developing culturally sensitive practice in social work and social care. I'm invited to come and speak to you about my poem and my book, and it's an absolute pleasure to do that today. So before we start, um, can I ask diversity, because the terminology diversity, it, sometimes it's used on its own, sometimes it's used um, with equality, diversity and equality, diversity, equality, inclusion, cultural competence. Can I just say, can anyone, someone just throw a word at me, another word for diversity? If you want to put it on the chat, another word for diversity, just trying to get a, a, a definition, a simple definition. Just one word is enough for diversity. Does that, has anyone attempted anything, Kelly? Yeah, we've, we've already got a few things in here, Vivian. Quite a lot of people putting in difference, individuality, Fabulous. individuality we've got, multicultural. Fabulous. Uh, we've got uh, inclusivity, individuality, Fabulous. Um, we've got representing all the different types of people in the world and their mm -hmm. cultures, variety, um, assortment, uh, difference, ver uh, variety again, individuals. So lots of difference and variety um, yeah. coming through. Fabulous. Here. That's the key word that was the first word that someone said. Someone said difference. Diversity simply means difference from you know, variety, individuality. But I would like to give you my own definition, but actually what I'll give you a definition from ACAS. ACAS is Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service, um, a non-departmental public body of, of the government. I'd like to give you that definition of diversity. So that definition says recognizing, valuing, and taking account of people's different backgrounds, people's knowledge, people's skills, experiences, and encouraging and using those differences to create a productive and an effective workforce. 
So that's the definition by ACAS. So I wanted to um, put that definition out there for, for us today, just to, to ponder about that. Those are the things that you just mentioned, difference, variety, you know, difference in knowledge, difference in background, difference in knowledge, skills, talent, experiences. So that is what diversity is in a nutshell. So following that, I've got a quiz as well. I like quizzes. So I've got a, a quiz, it's a simple quiz actually, just to get us going. So my next quiz will be, what are the, what are the two key pieces of legislation that underpin equality and diversity? So what are the two key pieces of legislation that underpin equality and diversity? So if, if you wanna put it on, your, on the chat, if, you know, no pressure, Okay, Vivian, we've got lots and lots and lots of people saying Equality Act 2010. Um, so we've got lots of one piece of legislation, but then the second piece of legislation people are talking about is the Human Rights Act. Fabulous. So we've got Fabulous. Equality Act and the Human Rights Act. Fab. Fabulous. All of that will apply. I was, yeah, I was looking for the Equality Act 2010. Um, and the Human Rights Act 1998. So those are in interesting, interesting. So whoever got that right, well done, well done to you. Well done to those people that got it right. Um, so the next quiz is, what are the nine protected characteristics? The nine protected characteristics. Now try putting in your chat as many as you know. <laughs> so what are the nine protected characteristics? Okay, so shall I tell you what we've got in the chat, Vivian, because it's going uh, really rapidly here. So uh, <laughs> I'm not great at the chat, so I've got to try and find them as they come in. So we've got religion, sex, disability, age, um, gender, um, we've got maternity, question mark, gender, marriage, pregnancy, age, gender reassignment, um, race, pregnancy, um we've got loads coming up in, i think i've captured the all everything that's in the chat so far sexual orientation fabulous disability yeah marriage civil partnership all of yeah them. we've got civil partnership uh, pregnancy fabulous. We've got religion we've got race race is big isn't it race um disability so all of those make up the equality act protected characteristics now, if you got at least six of them right, then I'll say give yourself a pass mark. Pat yourself in the shoulder and give yourself a pass mark. Now, um, I would say that if you haven't got up to five correct, then I would encourage you to go back and look at them. Okay, so they are very important within this topic that we're looking at today. The equality are protected characteristics, which are about nine. So finally, my third quiz question, just to get us started is, what are those factors that make up a person's culture? So again, one, 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 one point, two points. What are those, what are the factors that make up a person's culture? Okay, so we've got in the chat belief systems, language, identity, background, values, belief, family ties, traditions, food, uh, background stories. I'm, I'm, things are going so quick. Spirituality, um, norms, identity and values, heritage, um, culture, the way that you brought up, nature and nurture, religion, clothing, ideology, um, norms and values, a whole range of different things that are, are being drawn together here in the chat. Fabulous. Well done, people. Thank you so much. It's covered. You've covered it all. You know, the a culture is an inherited system of shared beliefs, customs and behaviors used by members of a society to cope with their world and with one another and is transmitted from generation to generation through learning. So again, we talked about religion, we talked about family ties, language, identity, shared beliefs, shared customs, shared stories. Those are the things that make up culture. So yes, I just wanted to get that out there before we start the session. Thank you very much for participating in that first section. So without further ado, I will talk to you about my poem, 
It is a poem that I'm very proud of. It's called The Diversity Acrostic Poem, um, Working with Diversity and Developing Culturally Sensitive Practice in Social Work and Social Care. So although it says that it's in, it's in social work and social care, I actually think that is a poem for everybody. So just bearing that in, in mind. So, so basically, um, I work in children's services and obviously we know that the welfare of the children that we look after comes first. So if you see my little people out there, they are varied um, little people, they are little people of difference. And what they are saying is our welfare comes first. So naturally for us as social workers, we know that when we work with children, when we work with vulnerable children or young people, vulnerable adults, you know, their welfare comes first and we're working to their best interest. So um, when I first came into social work, I was part of a management committee to look at diversity and how um, social workers can practice in a much more co culturally competent manner. And I went away from one of our meetings and I, I reflected on what diversity meant to me as an individual and working with diversity and how working, how working with diversity and developing culturally sensitive practice could be improved so that everyone is enjoying and receiving um, same treatment, everyone is included. So that's when I came up with the poem. What I did was I basically um, took the word diversity and created phrases, as you can see on the screen, I created phrases that best describe the act of working with diversity and becoming culturally competent. So there on the screen is D-I-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y, diversity. And each of the phrases, each of the letter has phrases that I feel best describes the act of working with diversity. And today's session will be to take you through each of those domains. Okay, I've said here, what I'm trying to say here is that as social care workers and as social workers, um, working with diversity is not actually, is not an option. It is something that we have to work with effectively. So it is a it is a core requirement in a social worker's toolbox. It is key. I've said here it is key to becoming a proficient social worker. So we, as social workers, we sign up to promote social change and social justice. We sign up to promote anti-oppressive practice, anti-discriminatory practice. Similarly, our education partners sign up for that. So by ensuring that children and young people are learning in a conducive environment and are, that they are achieving their potentials. So this is not an optional area because if we are working, for example, with vulnerable children or vulnerable young people, what we want to ensure is that they are enjoying and achieving. And we know that the children, the vulnerable children that we work with come from diverse backgrounds. So for me, this field of discourse is not optional. It is mandatory that we are culturally competent. So the College of Social Work in 2012 described and um, defines diversity and as characterizing and shaping human experience. It is crucial for the formation of identity. So because of difference and the perception of difference, a person's life experience may include oppression marginalization, alienation, as well as privilege, power, and acclaim. So this was a definition by the College of Social Work in 2012, now adopted by Bazwa in 2018. So for me, that is a good definition of what um, diversity characterizes and the fact that we as social work practitioners have to be skilled up around working with diversity and becoming culturally competent. So V, I says, invite people to talk about their cultures, their values, their beliefs and experiences. So what do I, what do I mean by that? So we're trying by inviting people to talk about their cultures, we're trying to acquire information and knowledge, knowing that information and knowledge is power. So what I'm saying here is let's allow the service users to tell us their individual stories and help us to get educated on how to work with them. 
So, we, for example, we know that those of us that work in children's services, for example, we know that there are some children, vulnerable children that we work with. They are children, they are small people, but their experiences far outweigh some of the experiences of the adults that work with them. So the only way that we can actually work effectively with these children is by listening to the children and allowing them to tell us the story of their life. So for example, we're not relying on X or Y to tell the story of Z or relying on the actions of a particular person, a particular group to dictate the story of others. In other words, let me be the one to tell you my story. So for example, if you wanted to know a little bit about me, you would come directly to me and ask me about myself. You wouldn't go to people that look like me to tell, tell you about me. So it's about inviting people talking to talk about their cultures, their beliefs, their lived experiences in order to be able to intervene effectively in their life. Now, Miller and Rod, Rod, Ronick 2002, Motivational Interviewing Techniques. I fell in love with that when I was in uni. So here I'm positing that that is a model that helps you to listen because Miller and Ronick 2002 in their motivational interviewing techniques will tell you how to engage in reflective listening with, with a non-judgmental attitude. So for example, when people are talk, talking to you about their deep cultures, their values, their beliefs, those things that mean very much to them, we want to, be a, we want to engage in a reflective manner in a non-judgmental manner so that we can actually get that information that we need to work with them. Now, the Dalai Lama says, and this is one of his quotes, which I like, he says, when you talk, you are repeating what you already know. But when you listen, you may actually learn something new. So that's a direct quote from the Dalai Lama, the Buddhist monk. So I like that quote. And, I, and so in with regards to inviting people to talk about their cultures, we need to learn to listen, not only listen, but hear what the people are saying to us. So V, value their history, individuality, and differences. So what I'm saying here is showing respect to people's cultures. It's showing respect to the difference around us. So we're remaining open-minded, we're remaining curious, for example, if you're working with clients and they're telling you about their individuality, their history, their different, you do not have to like it. You do not like to go along with it. You just need to acknowledge and make sense of actions before acting. And I'm speaking to myself as well. So we need to acknowledge what people are saying to us, make sense of it in order to be able to act effectively on their behalf. So, here, I'm also talking about not diminishing people, their culture, their beliefs, or undermining people's experiences. Because what that does is it reduces people psychologically. And that is not the aim of social work, social care, education. Because we're all in this humanitarian field of practice because we are drawn to helping people. We are drawn to, towards supporting people to get a, a better life for social change. So diminishing people, their cultures, which in turn reduces them psychologically, is not the aim of social work. And what, what, when you undermine people's cultures, beliefs, lifestyle experiences, it, 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 it reduces them psychologically and that can lower their self-esteem. And what does that do when they lose their self-esteem and lose their confidence? It impacts on their emotional, mental health. So this is why we have to value. So for example, when service users, clients, children, young people, adults, you know, trust us with those, their history, when they tr trust us with their lived experiences, we need to hold it with care. We need to hold it with care so we're not diminishing or reducing them because in so doing, we're gonna snatch their self-confidence. We're gonna snatch their self-esteem and what that would impact on their emotional mental health. 
So we try as under in valuing history, individuality, and differences, we're trying to reach out to connecting with people in however small ways. So we reach out to know more and we reach out to connect with people because if we don't form that relationship that is needed within our field of practice, we can't make those changes that we came into social work to make. So that's what value, value history under diversity is. So E, I'm saying, Explore clients' realities and show curiosity. So here we are exploring all of those things that we've been told, the life experiences, the history, the past trauma, we are exploring because these are the realities that, that the people live with. So for example, children will tell us some dire stories about what's happened to them, how they've come into care and, and how they've passed through separation. Because sometimes these children come into care and we forget sometimes as professionals that they, they, they separate, apart from the trauma that they've suffered, for example, they are now suffering additional trauma of being separated from their loved ones. So now their loved ones might be um, not, the great, not the loved ones that have been able to meet their needs or being able to cater to their needs. But don't forget that these young people, these young children, young people, they still love their family because they are, they are their family. So these are the realities that clients or some young people or, young, or adults will feel. So we want to explore further and we want to show curiosity. So this simply means that professionals strive to explore service users' experience. In social work and education, for example, this is where a professional's ability to display empathy is put to the test. An ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and feel their pain. Empathy is key in practice, is what I'm saying here. Because when clients are talking to us about their experiences, their lived experiences, we need to be able to employ that empathy within us to try and understand where they're coming from, to try and sit in their shoes so that we will be able to reach out more. So here I'm talking about showing an active interest in people's life, seeking to understand their vulnerabilities, showing a genuine desire to help, to help them overcome their challenges, displaying a caring attitude. And I like to say that social work and social care is a caring profession. So sometimes we as the social work practitioners, we have to be the voice of the children, particularly the children from the minority ethnic background who have lost, who have either lost their voice or simply haven't got a voice. So within exploring our clients' realities and showing curiosity, this is where we are the voice of the children particularly those children from the minority ethnic background who have lost their voice or simply haven't got a voice. So, and I would say there that social workers need to carry out deep exploration of service users' experiences. At this stage, a social worker's ability to demonstrate empathy is put to the test an ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and feel their pain. So that is a direct quote from my book. So, R in diversity. I'm saying, let's reflect upon information and ideas received. So we know in social work that reflection is a key part of social work. We, reflection helps us to further develop the act of reflecting and increases our ability to analyze situations and make judgments around complex day-to-day -day work undertaken with service users. And that's by Sean, 1983. Sean is the godfather of reflection. Those of you who know Sean will know that he's done a lot of work on reflection. And that's a quote from him. So re reflective listening to hear, to take away, process, and challenge yourself, 
So when we are, when 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 you know you are doing a reflective listening, this is when. How do you know you're you're listening reflectively? This is where you're when you're listening to hear. You're listening to take away process and challenge yourself. As professionals, we must challenge ourselves from time to time. And in challenging ourselves, we have to recognize core feelings. So critical reflection helps to recognize core feelings. That's by Moon 2004. It is therefore an essential ingredient for working with diversity. I'm saying that. So we have to recognize our feelings. We have to critically reflect, touch up those core feelings around issues of diversity. So Monroe 2013 will say is deep, insightful reasoning. So deep, insightful reasoning. Now, some of you will know Dan, Dan Siegel. Dan Siegel is a, um, has done a lot of work on, on mindset. I don't know if you've heard of interpersonal neurobiology. It talks about the, the mind's ability, the, the human ability to perceive the mind of self and others, and this is a reflective ability. So Dan Sigal will say, the human ability to perceive the mind of self and others and feel empathy for others. So that's in his work in interpersonal neurobiology. So what he's saying is we're focusing on the internal world to modify. We're, we're, we're focusing on our minds to modify. So in working with diversity, we are doing deep reflection. We are listening, we're hearing, we're taking away, we're recognizing core feelings, and we're trying, we're striving to dive into the sea. That's what Dan Seagull will say. He will say, dive into the sea in, within ourselves. There is a sea within ourselves. Let's dive in in order to be able to, to, to read our minds and modify what needs to be modified in order to work effectively with diversity. So the power of the mind to change the functioning of the brain. What does that mean? The power of the mind to change those things that we've learned from when we were children. So those stories we were told when we were children, those hand-me-downs from grandparents, grandparents, grandmom, granddad. This is where we begin to dive in, begin to try and use our mind to change the functioning of the brain. So that's reflect, that's my arm in reflect, in, in diversity, reflecting of, upon information and ideas received. S, scrutinize yourself, do a personal SWOT analysis. Okay, so before I came into social work, I was a banker. I'm sure some, some of you will smile at this stage. I was a business banker, but somewhere along the line, I felt I needed to come into the field of, um, into the humanitarian field of social work to, to, to make more meaning, to, to help people and to contribute more to the society. So um, when I was in business banking, we often talked about SWOT analysis analysis of the business strength, you know, looking at the strength of your business, the weakness, the opportunities available and the threats around your business. And so when I was doing my acrostic poem in my head, I said to myself, and, and I think Thompson 2006 alludes to this as well, about doing personal analysis of strengths, your personal strengths. What are those strengths? What strengths do I have around diversity? What are my core weaknesses? What are those opportunities available to me and what are the threats? Opportunities, for example, could be the training. For example, you're in this webinar. This is an opportunity of, for you to gather some knowledge, gather some information, however small, gather some resources around diversity. So that is the opportunity that you have. There are threats around. So in, within scrutinizing yourself, you have to sort of understand your personality as, a, as an individual and as a professional. You have to understand your capabilities, your limitations, and your learning needs. This is where we're getting in touch deeply with ourselves and scrutinizing those areas that need scrutinizing and trying to weed off those areas that are not compatible 
with working with diversity and replacing with areas that are compatible with working with diversity. This is where you're taking account of your own culture, your own perspective, your values and beliefs in relation to working with diversity and how they might affect your practice. So you're looking at your culture, you're looking at your perspective, your values, your beliefs in relation to diversity and how they might affect your practice. This is where you're examining your stereotypes, your prejudices, your bias, your assumptions. This is between you and yourself. This is where you're looking at hand-me-downs from our parents. We're looking at hand-me-downs from our grandparents. We're looking at hand-me-downs from our society. So this is a truthful and a genuine exercise that you are doing with yourself. So you can't lie to yourself. So a quote from my book there says, acknowledging white privilege, the possibility of conscious or unconscious bias is fundamental in engaging with cultural diversity and promoting justice and equality. So that is a quote from my book. And I'll just say that again. Acknowledging white privilege, the possibility of conscious and unconscious bias is fundamental in engaging with cultural diversity, promoting justice and equality. So that's S, scrutinize yourself. Do a personal analysis of your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities available to you and the threats around you. I says, identify strategies to aid your work. Now you've done the reflecting, you've done the scrutinizing, you need to now begin to identify strategies to aid your work. So this is where professionals begin to ask themselves the how questions. I call them the how questions. How can I, as a professional, rewrite history? How can I, as an individual or a professional, challenge racial construct to embrace diversity? How do I engage with authenticity? So these are the how questions that professionals need to start asking themselves, haven't done the deep reflection, haven't done the scrutiny, haven't started from D all the way to I. You need to begin as a professional to identify strategies. And you ask yourself, what are my best strategies? What is available to me to obtain knowledge and address my uncertainties? And I say uncertainties. So this is where you're thinking of, again, you're thinking of training. You're thinking of going for training. You're thinking of going for diversity training, anti-racism training. You're looking at research that's been done. You're looking at management, mentor, and peer supervision. All of these are strategies that you can engage with to learn more. So you're within your supervisions, you're talking of strategies that will aid you in a particular area. Within, you can speak to your colleagues from, who are from a different background. And all of these will help you to address your uncertainties. And, you, and, and also you're ensuring that you're making good meaning of this because there's no, there's no use gathering information or doing all of the training, the supervision, the peer supervision without putting them into practice or making good meaning of this, which means what I mean is you're opening yourself to learning. So you can use relevant models. We talked about, we, first of all, you have to equip yourself with information, which is why we talked about the Equality Act protected characteristics. You have to know what you're up against or, you know, and you have to know what your privileges are. Without knowing, for example, the protected characteristics, how can you even begin to work well with diversity? So you talk about, for example, social graces. So there are resources out there you know, to help you. You also open yourself to learning from people of difference. And I did say that about the children, for example, vulnerable children that we work with, we learn from them. We learn from the black and minority ethnic groups. We learn from disadvantaged groups. Let's not get defensive. So we don't, at this, at this point of identifying strategies 
to aid our work. We're trying not to be defensive. We're trying to be open as much as possible to learning. So I've said that develop a learning attitude because indeed we are all learners. So T says, train yourself to treat people, to treat families individually. So train yourself to treat people, to treat families individually. So this is where we are, we are stepping out of the zone of a one-way response to situations or a one-size-fits-all approach. So we're not giving collective interventions for certain people or a group of people. We're individualizing our intervention to the individuals in front of us, to the individuals that are less privileged, to the individuals that are from the minority ethnic background who have got a voice or who have lost their voice in the process. So we are seeking a clear and reasonable understanding of people, of their beliefs, of their circumstances in order to tailor our work to meet their needs. So we develop the ability to treat people individually and we're thinking creatively each time in a fair and objective manner. So in treating people individually, we're thinking creatively each time. Each person is different. So each intervention is different. So we are thinking, we're thinking of creative ways of meeting needs. Within this, we are balancing power in such a way to impact service users positively. When I mean balance power, we are social workers wedge power because we're working with vulnerable individuals people that tell us their stories, people that are traumatized, people that open up their whole life to us. We need to balance power in such a way that in service users are impacted positively. So we are connecting in much deeper ways with our service users, our clients, to be able to carry out robust interventions and make a difference. So we want to carry out robust intervention with not just a certain group of people. We want to carry out robust intervention for every client that comes our way, regardless of their background, regardless of their culture, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their preferences, their likes. What we want to see when we see them is they are vulnerable. They need our support. They need our help. So what we do is we connect with them in order to correct. We connect with them in order to correct behavior, in order to bring about that social change, which our profession, social work, social care, education professes to give. And um, Dan Hughes, I borrowed that quote from Dan Hughes. You have to connect in order to actually correct, not connect. So there it should be correct. Connect in order to correct. And that's by Dan Hughes. Finally, I will say you've worked really hard. You've worked from D I V E R S I T, and you get to Y. You need to begin to yield yourself to culturally sensitive practice. So that's what my Y in diversity. We've worked so hard, we've worked all the way from D. Get into why we need to kind of yield. And if you see, and I see there's a picture there, the light bulb moment. And then, so what I'm saying is, having done all there is to stand, ladies and gentlemen, you must stand firm and become a culturally competent practitioner. So as a social work practitioner who made an intentional decision to enter the humanitarian field, of social work, social care, education. You must yield yourself to culturally sensitive practice. And I put emphasis on intentional decision because I'm, I'm presuming that we weren't forced into this profession. We made an intentional decision to come into the humanitarian field of social work. Because I'm saying here, it forms ba the basis of the social work profession. Likewise, I like to include the education staff because they provide education. They are the trainers of the, the, gener the next generation. 
So we are all dealing with children, some of them vulnerable. So we have to understand culture as being dynamic. We have to challenge stereotypes. We have to reject prescribed cultural understanding in favor of focusing on individual characteristics. And this is where, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say to you, this is where you begin to own your practice and you begin to train others. I know that we're not using the PCF professional capabilities and framework anymore, but it's still there. There are nine, there are nine domains and the domain nine talks of being a professional leader in your field. So what I'm saying is when you get to why, when you've yielded, you've yielded yourself to cultural sensitive practice, this is where you're owning your practice and you begin to train others and become a professional leader in your field of practice. So that is the diversity acrostic poem. Will I pause? Does anyone have a question before we continue? Or does anyone... I, I think Vivian, if you want to carry on, what we'll do now is invite people if they want to um, put some questions into the chat, that would be great. And then I think we'll, we'll have a conversation maybe about it once you've gone through and given us that diversity. Um, so if um, anyone does have questions, please do pop them either into the chat or into the Q&A and then Vivian will be able to answer them for you uh, at the end when she's done this summary for us. Thanks, Vivian. Okay, fabulous. So summary then. So I'm saying, and this is a quote from my book, as social workers, we must seek to, to recognize and have reasonable understanding of the client's world in order to be able to translate presented behaviors to profile enduring solutions. I think it's a long-winded sentence, so I'm gonna say it again. As social workers, we must seek to recognize and have reasonable understanding of the client's world in order to be able to translate presented behaviors to proper enduring solutions. Storytelling. Storytelling is one of the most effective way to convey a message and hear a message. We all remember the stories we were told in our childhood. The tendency for these stories to stick for a long time, for a lifetime. It is, however, important that we as professionals in this revolving world of new and spectacular unknowns and unbelievables begin to rewrite histories to give positive narratives. So the reason why I say revolving world of new and spectacular unknowns, in December of 2019, Nobody knew what COVID was going to do. Nobody knew that COVID was going to come in and take over the next year and a half. So spectacular unknowns, unbelievable, and begin to rewrite history to give positive narratives. So Commas, Diaz, and Jacobs in 1991, this is a quote from them. So lack of knowledge or understanding of a particular a particular client's culture, family dynamics, or worldview often gives rise to resistance and could delay or harm the social work intervention process. So I wanted that, um, I wanted you to take that because I like that. And this is so, one of the things that guides me in my work as a social worker. So it says lack of knowledge or understanding of a particular client's culture, family dynamics, or worldview often gives rise to resistance and could delay or harm the social work intervention process. And that's by Comas Diaz and Jacobson, 1991. So, what I would like you to take away today, I've just put down some reflective questions that I would like you to ponder once you've left the webinar today. So my question to you will be, why must you be a culturally competent practitioner? So 
I believe that's a question that you can ask yourself. And you could also ask yourself, does cultural competence evolve or does it remain stagnant? And then I would like to ask you today, will your pr priorities in this area of work change after today's webinar? I hope so. So what are the barriers to this area of work? So I'm mindful and I acknowledge that, he, that there are huge barriers with working with diversity. So my question to you today will be, what are those barriers and how, in fact, can you overcome those barriers? What are the barriers in being a culturally sensitive practitioner? What are the barriers of being an anti-racist practitioner? What are the barriers of working with diversity around you and becoming culturally competent? So earlier on, when we started this webinar, I spoke to you about the reason why I expanded my diversity poem into a book. And that was in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. So when George Floyd happened around about May 2020, excuse me, we know that it had profound impact on the whole world. It had profound impact on different people in different ways. So a lot of people went out to protest, protest against the murder, which was brutal, which was uncalled for, and which was sad. So people went out to protest against it. And during that time was when COVID was rampaging through, you know, the country, the world. And I remember the Prime Minister Boris Johnson said to us, please do not go out to protest because we're in a pandemic. There's a pandemic going on. Do not go out to protest. Right into Downing Street, do whatever it takes to protest against the murder of George Floyd, but please do not go into the streets. So I then sat down and wrote an open letter to all. This letter, I, if a tribute to George Floyd, and this was me trying to reach out to people, to touch people, and kind of engage with their empathy for something that had happened to a fellow human being. For me, I felt that that was an injury to humanity. So this open letter to all, I sent it to Downing Street, I sent it to wherever I could um, send the letter to because I wanted people to see, um, I wanted people to reason with what had happened to a fellow human being. So that letter, forms was was published in the west Sussex county times on june 18 2021 that letter forms a tribute to george floyd in my book so if you if you go to my book the author's note is this this letter and it's, it's a tribute to george floyd and i just want to give you a few lines of an extract from that letter so here i'm saying we are all indeed connected. Let us care enough to connect. Connect to the plight of disadvantaged people. There is room for all in our society. Diversity is the norm in nature. Being part of a minority is being part of the whole. So that's another quote. That is all of that is in my book. But I wanted that extract is part of the open letter to all that was published in the West Sussex County Times on the 18th of June, 2021, barely a month after the murder of George Floyd. And on my book, it forms part of the author's note. Okay, before I go, so let me just seize this opportunity to tell you a little bit about seeing we're talking about my book. So um, in my book, the authors not just kind of give pays tribute, the beginning pays tribute to George Floyd, which is about um, one, two, about four pages, pays tribute. It's more or less like a poem. People that have read it 
says it's a poem. So this is an extra, actually it's an, a letter where I'm trying to appeal to the empathy of the society, of the public to see that racism is real and that people, because George Floyd was not the first person, since George Floyd, there's been more. It is something that has continued and continues to happen. So that was a letter in which I'm saying, let's, let's, you know, let's try and, and, and tap into at the empathy of the society. So, so in the book, I've, uh, every, so I've, I, I like pictures, I'm sure you will see. So behind me is the book cover, obviously, I'm sure you've noticed that is the book, my book cover. So I like pictures. So what I've done is I've created a picture, sort of a picture. What I, want, what I wanted first and foremost with this book is, is to reach out to people in any way that we can reach out to people be it putting the colors in the book, be it making the writing bigger, be it putting quotes in the book. I have done all of those things because this book, The Diversity Acrostic Poem, is a book of solutions. That's what I call it. And it's a book, it's a very inclusive book. I call it a book of solution. I call it a book of unity because in my writing and in my thinking, I was saying to myself, there's a lot of dissension already. I don't want to make create more. So what we want to do is to create more togetherness and more unity, more inclusion. So that's what this book is about. So every, so every domain, so for example, chapter one of the book will be D, decide to be a culturally sensitive practitioner. And it, it, will, it will start off with an illustrative picture. I'm sure Siobhan, you would uh, confirm this. It starts off with an illustrative picture of what the book, of what I'm about to speak about in the book. So each, for, so D would have, will start off chapter one is D, for example. It will start off with an illustrative picture. I has an illustrative invite, has an illustrative picture, value, yield. All of those have an illustrative picture. And I've put a lot of quotes in the book. Um, as social workers, I, I was a student once before, so I know it's, how important it is to pass knowledge out and also to share knowledge of other experts as well. So you will see quotes from, from Dr. Neil Thompson, quotes from the Dalai Lama wisdom, because we know that he's um, a monk that gives a lot, out a lot of wisdom. You will see quotes from, you know, social work experts, because I want people to try and understand um, what the topic, the topic of, of discourse. And then at the end, uh, of the book, I have written, I think some people call me a letter writer. <laughs> so I have written a letter to, to the readers. Again, so I've started the book with a letter which is paying tribute, which pays tribute to Judge Floyd. And I've ended the book with a letter to readers. Again, I'm trying to tap into the empathy of man, really. And then I've also, within my letter, I have spoken to fellow Black social work and social care professionals. I've also spoken to fellow white social workers and social care professionals. I have mentioned recent events um, in the book, which will help educate people. I've also given a personal story in one of the domains under scrutinized. I've written a story, a personal story of myself so again, to try and impact, it's, it's, it's a story that will make you laugh, but again, it impacts, you know, gives education out. So yes, so that is the diversity, that is the book, it's out there. Um, I'm happy to say that um, I, couldn't not, I could not, not speak of my book and not talk about Outlanders. So Outlanders, um, sh um, my poem is also published in, in the book Outlanders. And I feel proud to think about two good books. And I'm not just talking about my poem being published. So the diversity acrostic poem, I have got very good feedbacks on it. In the same way, I can feedback on Outlanders, which is also a, a good book that draws insight to the experiences of people from the minority ethnic background. So um, yeah. The, Outlanders, well done, thank you. If Wayne is here, Siobhan, I wanna seize this opportunity to say, 
Thank you very much for publishing Outlanders. For me, I feel proud to say that those two books were published in, the, in, in 2021. I believe Outlanders was published in March and the diversity, I believe if I'm, if I'm correct, and the diversity acrostic poem was published a month after, April 30th, 2021. Yeah. So I am proud to say that those are books Thank that are there to help people, to support people. And what I say, my popular slogan in relation to my book is, let's not just talk about racism, let's do something about it. So we've been talking about racism for generations, for years and years. It's high time we start doing something about it. So the next slide is going to show you a little bit of what I've started doing about diversity aside from writing my book. So we know that we are in the moment of the Black history, Black history in the UK. So obviously the UK celebrates October every year and it's put aside for Black History Month. So what I did this year was um, I got people, I've, I started an initiative called Education from the Public to the Public. Black History Month, October 2021, Education from the Public to the Public. And this is happening on social media right now. So what I've done is, um, because I got good response to the book, and good feedback. So I said to people, take the book, take a picture of yourself if you're happy to do so. Obviously, this was on voluntary basis. Take a picture of my book and pick out an aspect of the book that speaks to you around diversity or tells you or helps that would help you in practice going forward. And I got a lot of um, good feedback from that. I've got responses from that. So. This is a campaign that has been running from the 1st of October. So what I wanted in my head, in my mind, I wanted every day of the Black History Month to be well utilized. I wanted to make that noise about Black history. So it's not just one day in October. It's gonna be every day in October, 2021. We're gonna be sending out messages to educate on Black history, to educate on, on, on ways in which we can become culturally sensitive. So people, some of the people that have come back to me is what you see in your screen. So this lady here is a teacher here in the UK. And according to her, the aspect of the book that touches her is what the quote on there. It says, undermining people's cultures, beliefs and experiences diminishes them psychologically and can lower their self-esteem impacting their emotional mental health. So what does, so I believe, because we've just celebrated a mental, World Mental Health Day recently. It's interesting because that quote from the book, I've got about five or six people quoting this. This is one of the things that has resonated with people in, this, in my book. Because someone said to me, I'm so glad that you highlighted that because, you know, when you're at work and you're being ignored or you're not being praised or, or you're being tre you're treated as less than you are because of your accent, because of one thing or the other, it undermines you psychologically. You lose your confidence, you lose your self-esteem and that impacts on emotional mental health. That is one of the most popular quotes from my book that people have found useful. So that was one of the days went out on. So we're doing this, this um, awareness on LinkedIn at Vivian Okeze Tirado on LinkedIn. On Facebook will be VOT training. On, um, what else is it? On Twitter will be at Viv Okeze Tirado. So that's where we're putting out. Today is day 20 of, and we'll be putting out messages. So another message, just, so this lady, it's a social worker. So the lady behind is, a, is, an ad, is an advanced social worker in one of the local authorities. And the lady, the lady in front is her friend, um, her work colleague and friend. And their message they wanted to go out was, diversity creates great friendships. 
Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. So Dr. Neil Thompson is also part of this campaign and he sent me a picture of himself and what he likes is, he says, I like it when authors are working together to combat racism. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. And that, that is um, invited. This lady here, she's a, a social worker, adult services. She says inviting people to speak about their culture gives them consent to be themselves. And finally, um, this is um, a podcast host. And she says, invite people to talk about their cultures, values, beliefs, and experiences is one of the letters that resonates with her and she's happy with. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you very much for that. Um, if you just want to move to the final slide to show people what we've got next week, because I know sometimes people want to just be able to see that final slide of ours so they know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks, then you can see that. But I would just like to say thank you so much, Vivian, for coming. I want my response, Vivian, to what you've shared with us is I think this is more than a poem. You describe it a lot as your diversity poem. I think what you've given us is a model for social work. And I think we've got to acknowledge that, you know, very often, I mean, I talk a lot about theories and models. I write about theories and models. And when in our webinars, we talk about what a theory is and what a model is. And for me, what you've provided us with is a model for social work intervention, a model for culturally competent, culturally aware, anti-oppressive social work. I think that's what you've created. I think it's more than a poem. I think it builds on critical race theory. I think it, it helps. It, it reminds me very much when I'm listening to you, there are lots of parallels with the work of Prospera Tedham, who is a, you know, a, someone who's, who's been a guest speaker for us in the webinars a couple of times. And I think it's really important that we hear the voices of black women in social work. I think that's vital. And so I think raising the profile of your model of diversity, I think is very important. Um, and I think as you were talking and as you were presenting to us to help us to think about diversity, I think it, what is really helpful, what came through really strongly was you're a practitioner and you've got passion for this and you've been at work today all day as a social worker and that's what comes through when you're presenting it's different to an academic saying you know here's something I've I've based some I've done a bit of research and here's a bit of a model I've created what you've done is it's real it's raw it's real and it comes from your heart Vivian and that really came through very strongly so for me this is a model. And I'd like the students here, because lots of people who come to our session are students, I'd like you to think about how you can bring the diversity model into your practice, into your assignments. I'd like you to think about that and, and start to, you know, let's start to be critical about where our models in social work come from. They need to come from effective role models like Vivian. So thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Really yeah. lovely to hear. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. It's been a fabulous webinar. I always really like the webinars where I can just sit back and learn, you know, and just kind of hand it over. And I just enjoyed sitting back and listening. Um, and, you know, I think what you did was you you really dug into diversity and you really helped us to think about that. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. You're welcome anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vivian. And for everybody who here hopefully we'll see you next week it's a team-led webinar we've got next week on professional love what that means why it's important and how we demonstrate it in social work practice and that uh, is a theme that's actually been inspired by uh, probably the best presentation I've ever seen by a newly qualified worker at a session so lots of uh, I think interesting things for us to think about and talk about and discuss next week but um, thank you very much Vivian I don't think we've We've got time for the questions but we will send the questions on to you and hopefully we'll be able to email thank people you. back so thank thanks you. ever so much everybody and good night to everyone thank you for bye, coming everyone bye